Welcome to another episode of Legacy Battle. I am Michael Adams, your creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists tonight from Good Iron Battle Zone, Brian King, Penn State Collegiate All-Star, Kevin Adams, from Steelers Nation South, Rollo Cawthon. Our debate tonight is the greatest ECW wrestler of all time. Uh, you know, with ECW, that's a little different than picking wrestlers from other, you know, factions. So uh, our guest tonight, though, is a two-time ECW World Tag Team Champion and an ECW World Heavyweight Champion. He's held championships in, in several other companies, including the Impact World Heavyweight Championship, and he is an eight-time hardcore WWE champion. In 2000, PWI ranked him as the sixth best singles wrestler on their top 500. That is incredible. Uh, he has had several names. He's Aldo Montoya, Portuguese Man of War, my favorite, just incredible. So we got Peter Polacco, PG. PJ, thank you so much for joining us. What's going on, guys? Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Awesome. As always, we're going to have a, a Q&A for him after our debate, and uh, we're going to start tonight uh, with Brian and Rod Van Dam. Okay, R RVD, Rob Van Dam, uh, six foot tall, 245 pounds. Uh, his ring name had its roots in his similarities to the uh, martial arts legend and famous actor John Claude Van Dam. Uh, RVD, uh, you know, he has a strong mar martial arts background as well, and it came into the pl it came into play often while he was in the ring. Uh, interestingly, RVD's first appearance inside a pro wrestling ring was actually not for a match. But when he was chosen from the crowd for an opportunity to kiss the million dollar man's foot, I mean, a thousand dollars is a thousand dollars. But RVD uh, spent some time in the Japanese uh, wrestling circuit and with WCW, but his career was kind of stagnant. Uh, but when Paul Heyman took over ECW in 1993 and RVD joined a few years later, it set up a perfect match. RVD's laid back, stoner style type uh, with um, ECW's anything goes approach. So during his five-year stint in ECW, RVD was a major player. Uh, he had some nice feuds with Tommy Dreamer and Taz, and he had an awesome feud with Sabu. Uh, his stretcher match against him was epic, and he really found ways to get under his skin by not showing him the proper respect uh, he expected. But eventually, RVD joined forces with, with Sabu, and he won the uh, World Tag Team title two separate times. RVD was also the ECW uh, television champion for a nearly a two-year span from April of 98 to uh, March of 2000 uh, until he had to relinqu uh, relinquish it due to an injury. In 2001, RVD challenged WWE champion John Cena to a title match on one night stand. Uh, he defeated Cena and won the world championship. Then Paul Heyman reactivated the ECW heavyweight championship and awarded it to RVD, making him the only man in wrestling history to hold both titles. Uh, also in 2001, he was voted most popular wrestler by Pro Wrestling Illustrated. And in 2014, the WWE named RVD the greatest star in ECW history. And I believe they made the right choice. So, PJ, he was the first one really in the mainstream over here in America to put martial arts and use that Japanese style of wrestling. So what are your thoughts on, on his style? It's a lot different than what the American style was. Um, yeah, it, it was, I mean, you, you got to, and I, I don't know this for certain. I never spoke to Rob about this, but, um, you know, growing up as I did as a kid and like, you know, his formative years were probably in the mid eighties. Um, those karate movies were huge back in the eighties, like the Jean-Claude Van Damme movies, uh, kickboxer. And then, and, and those movies were so big and he was like, Jean-Claude was like an underground star. And I think that, and you know, and the fact that Rob and him sort of looked a little bit alike, I know Rob was probably a big fan of those movies because he always wanted to do like action movies, uh, you know, after, you know, like, you know, when he was wrestling and stuff, he was, he was dabbling in that. So I, I could just see him wanting to, you know, kind of emulate that and bring that to the forefront. But the way he did it was very uh, unconventional. Like he was the first one kind of doing you know, real kicks and like different kinds of stuff, not necessarily based in the wrestling world, which was, uh, you know, sometimes very, um, what's the right word? Unconventional, I guess is the best way to say it. Cause it, you weren't bump, you know, you didn't know how to bump for it. You didn't know how to necessarily, uh, anticipate the move. It was very unorthodox, but, uh, definitely a style that come to serve him well, because, 
uh, to this day, he was one of the only guys really kind of doing it. I mean, more people do that stuff now than ever. But, uh, you know, 20 years ago, man, that was, uh, it was, you know, he was one of the innovators for sure. Probably our best in-ring technician tonight that we're talking about. But let's move on to our best mic man tonight. Let's go, Raven. Yeah, so Raven, uh, so when Scott Levy left the WWE or WWF, that's when he developed Raven. Uh, his character was basically inspired by Edgar Allan Poe and Patrick Swayze's character from Point Break. Uh, he bulked himself up to 235 to become the Raven. And he had to add p some piercings to his face, changed up his clothing a little bit, he'd wear ragged shorts, leather jacket, comic book shirts, rock band shirts. He would end his promos with, quote, the Raven nevermore. Uh, he played a sociopath and would feud most of his uh, ECW career with Tommy Dreamer. Uh, he was basically brought in to be the enemy of Tommy. Um, his debut was in January of 95, which immediately began the rivalry with, with Tommy Dreamer. Uh, this was supposed to be basically a four-month uh, run uh, to establish the Raven as a character uh, before moving back to possibly the WWE. Uh, it now became a legendary feud that served as the backbone for the company throughout majority of its run. He wrestled in ECW from 95 to 97 and dominated for most of that time. Tommy Dreamer couldn't even beat Raven no matter what he did for the longest time. He came to an ECW arena in June of 97, uh, when the two-year-plus rivalry came to a head uh, in which the loser would have to leave town uh, if they lost the match. The two went out, put on one of the greatest matches in company history, uh, and it was Dreamer who finally got the best of Raven by hitting him with one less DDT, finally defeating him. Uh, caused Raven caused him much pain, sending him uh, out, out, of, out of his way from the company. Raven would not be back to ECW until the year 2000. His initial run uh, was his peak, but he had another legendary feud when he came back, and people still discuss it to this day, and that was uh, with the Sandman. Um, during that time, uh, he had great psychological attacks. Uh, he would capture the company's world title on two occasions, establishing him as a professional wrestler. Vince McMahon didn't believe he could be uh, that just a few years prior, uh, he walked away from working with Vince uh, in a six-figure salary uh, to get hit with chairs and roll around on the barbed wire uh, in a warehouse in Philly. It all paid off in the end uh, with a contract with WCW, but it ended um, just three days later. Raven like shocked everyone, uh, returned to ECW uh, to one of the largest crowd reactions in company history. Defeated the Dudley Boys for the Tag Team Championship as a mystery partner for the clueless Tommy Dreamer. WWE.com did a top 30 ECW wrestlers of all time. Raven was number eight. Um, I mean, he had he had skills. He had quite some legendary feuds. Uh, he's, he's a good uh, candidate for our topic tonight. Well, at this point, it doesn't really matter what Vince McMahon thinks of anybody because we all know where he's at. So, True. P PJ, I, I come to you. Raven, like I said, he's... How good was he on the microphone? And, you know, that rivalry with Tommy Dreamer, it is the best in the company. Um, one thing about Scotty, when you give him, when you give him that kind of, uh, which Paul did, give him the, the platform and the, the canvas to paint on. I mean, he was one of the best uh, creative, um, you know, and he was trying to do stuff that uh, incorporate some old school stuff, but also do some new school stuff. He was trying to do things that he saw in movies, um, just, you know, really going beyond what you would expect of a pro wrestling angle, like really go deeper. Um, he was so good at that. A great talker, um, very charismatic, could go in the ring um and you know cut a hell of a promo so he was uh, to me like i loved working with him i thought scott levy aka raven was truly one of the best um and uh very underrated unfortunately but uh yeah I, the stuff he did in ecw was epic uh not just with dreamer but like you said earlier the sandman um which we just saw in dark side of the ring they kind of featured that a little bit um just just amazing amazing stuff from him well, our honorable mentions tonight guys that just missed our picks was Cactus Jack, Terry Funk, the Dudley, Sandman, and Shane Douglas. Let's move to our third wrestler, Tommy Dreamer. Thomas James Laughlin, better known as Tommy Dreamer. Uh, he started his career in the international world-class championship wrestling as TD Madison in the early 90s. Uh, he certainly changed his name to Tommy Dreamer shortly after as a tribute to his idol, the American Dream Dusty Rhodes. 
he joined ECW in 93 and his first gimmick had him as a pretty boy wearing green suspenders. Green suspenders, yeah. Uh, he was supposed to be a clean cut baby face in a land of tough guys and jocks. He was hated by the crowd even after he was the first to ever kick out of a Superfly Snooker uh, splash from Jimmy Snooker. Uh, but Hall of Famer Paul Heyman stop stepped in and had Tommy Dreamer go against the Sandman in an I Quit match. The loser would, would be caned, and of course, Dreamer lost, resulting in getting caned 10 times. Same Sandman asked Dreamer if he had enough, and he said, he put seven words out there, thank you, sir, may I have another. And the innovator of violence was born. Uh, that feud with Sandman would lead into his most memorable feud, which was already touched on by Kevin in 95, as he uh, feuded with Raven. Um, and that would take the better part of two years. Um, and he would get, after that, he would get into uh, memorable feuds with the Dudley Boys and Jerry King Lawler. Uh, but it was his brand of parkour wrestling that made him a huge fan favorite. And many called him the blood and guts of ECW. Uh, what makes him great uh, was he married Beulah McGillicuddy. Let's remember that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was the ECW champ once and held the ECW title three times with Johnny Green, Masato Tanaka, and of course his, ri his rival, uh, Raven. He was named uh, top five, he named number five on WWE's uh, top 30 uh, ECW wrestlers. And in two, 2022, he was voted number one on the 20 best wrestlers that defined ECW. So, PJ, to me, Tommy Dreamer doesn't get the respect he deserves either. I mean, he he was an innovator. So what are your thoughts on on what he brought to the wrestling business? Uh, I agree. Uh, I think he is probably one, if the not most important uh, person in ECW for many reasons. Not just uh, what we see from a creative standpoint, but uh, from just a behind-the-scenes thing. Um, Tommy Dreamer helped keep ECW alive in many ways. Uh, financially as well sometimes. A lot of people don't know that. He went into his own bank account to keep uh, the, the, the funds rolling. Um, so, yeah, Tommy Dreamer, um, both inside and outside of the ring, was uh, amazing, great to work with, um, totally underrated, uh, but, you know, really talented. Uh, you know, again, he doesn't get the props because people don't, you know, unless you're in the ring with him, you don't understand the little things he actually does. Um, he's very methodical. He's very, um, what do you call it? Just just very cer cerebral, so to speak. Uh, much better than uh, what his physical attributes sometimes can show you. Uh, just a hell of a guy. And in the ring, man, uh, one of the best matches I've, I've had consistently. I've feuded with him for a very long time. And uh, always one of my personal favorites to be in the ring with. Our final wrestler tonight is Terrence Michael Brunk better known as the suicidal, homicidal, genocidal, death-defying Sabu. This man was a pioneer of hardcore wrestling. And from 95 to 2000, he was a dominant force and fan favorite in ECW. He is a two-time ECW World Heavyweight Champion, three-time Tag Team Champion, and the World TV Champion. He is ECW's second Triple Crown Champion. So that's an impressive stat for him. And of course, he went into that Hardcore Hall of Fame in 2009. Now, his style was a high-flying acrobatic mixed with hardcore, something that uh, we hadn't seen a lot of over here in the U.S. Uh, he was a master of using the chair as a weapon. Several unique moves involved the chair. And, of course, no ECW episode would be complete without Sabu going through a table or two tables or a table that's on fire. So yeah. he took everything to the next level. No wrestler was crazy crazier than what he was and and his nickname it says it all suicidal homicidal genocidal death defying the maniac sabu pj what do you think of sabu um he's one that does uh and i'm not just the only one that said this uh x Pac has said this my former partner as well um he does not get the uh the accolades and the recognition he deserves um, in this business, because really he started the style. He innovated a style that if you really look back, few people were doing in the United States at all. Um, if you really look at the the kind of stuff he was doing with the, you know, with the with the flips and using the ropes and using chairs and 
tables and just all the stuff he was doing. Uh, I mean, nobody had done that before. Not here, at least. Uh, I hadn't seen anybody. He was completely, completely a pioneer. And, uh, he, you know, he, he should have made a million dollars, man. Or, you know, more than that. I mean, he should have really... Uh, I wish he was one of the wrestlers that got taken care of um, because he put his body through hell, had some of the greatest, most memorable matches in ECW history and all of wrestling history, quite honestly. Um, and he brought a style that many people use to this day. Uh, you watch AEW or or TNA or even WWE, you could see a lot of Sabu influences that you would not see if he had not been uh, in ECW and been doing that uh, from the very beginning. And uh, again, I wrestled him for a very long time as well. And uh, whoo! Great guy to work with, man. Really, really, really fun. So of our four guys tonight, RVD is the only one in the WWE Hall of Fame. I think now that Paul Levesque, Triple H, is running things, I think we're going to see him show a little more respect, and we may see some of these guys starting to get in that you know Vince would never put in. We saw that with Paul Heyman being his very first pick this year who created ECW. But let's move into our vote. Can't pick your own, guys. Brian, who are you taking? Uh, this is really tough because there's, I mean, everybody's kind of close to equal. And he, there's even some guys over in honorable mentions that are kind of close to equal to these guys too. But I, I got to go with uh, Sabu because, I mean, that that dude was putting, I, he was just putting his body through hell. It was just amazing what he was able to do, all the high-flying stunts. Yeah. I'm going to go Tommy Dreamer. Uh, I don't know. When I think of ECW, Dreamer's kind of the one that I think of. And I think tonight's show is more about, the, the legacy of ECW than it is just like, you know, one particular person and Dreamer is that legacy for me. Rollo. This was kind of easy for me. Uh, uh. <laughs> okay. he, held that he held that what? television title for almost two, two and a half years. The television title, and he had to give it up. So yeah, RVD. <laughs> one for RVD. Kevin? Um, I agree. With, I agree with you, Mike, on the uh, Tommy Dreamer and the legacy part of it. My guy kind of helped create that legacy too. So, you're, you're agreeing with me? 193 episodes. That's happened like maybe three times. Okay, and that's <laughs> awesome. PJ, we come to you. Who would you pick out of those four? Um, only because I've said this before, and uh, I, I really believe it. I have to go as much as all of them deserve uh, recognition. I have to go with Sabu. I mean, again, uh, going back to when he first stepped foot from uh, FMW in Japan. Uh, over to the United States in uh, 92. We'd never seen anything like him. And I think the wrestling world would be a very different place if we had not seen Sabu. So just from influence alone uh, on the history of the business, I'd have to say Sabu for sure. So that's two for Sabu, two for Dreamer, one for RVD. When we got a tie on our show, the guest vote counts a little bit more. So that's a win for Sabu and me. Let's move into our Q&A. Nice job, guys. Uh, I get to start, then we go Brian, Kevin, Rollo. So I I'm going to throw a hard one right here, right at you, right off the top here. We all know the stories of what wrestlers go through, what happens behind the stage. You've battled your own demons. What advice would you give a young wrestler in today's business to, to, to make it through? Um, You know, just uh, just keep your... Just keep yourself, uh, you know, just follow what you're told, man. As far as like, keep your mouth shut, your ears open, do what you're told, in, you know, by your by your promoter, by you know your, you know, kind of the the people you're working for. Um, just just be there, be the first one there, last one to leave. Always be super, you know, super. If you're into what you do, like in WWE, for example. Um, you get heat if you leave early, like you know what I mean. You're you you could leave whenever you want if you're not booked on television, right? You could leave midway during a raw, but you know the people notice. So to me, it's like watch the matches, be a student of the game, um, you know, just stuff like that. Put as much much into it as you want out of it, and uh, you know, just always keep trying to learn, learn and and, and work hard, man, because. Um, it, it's, a, it's a rough business out there today. Um, not as far as, you know, physicality. I'm just saying as far as making it because there are so many great men and women out there. Um, it's a lot harder today to make it than it was in my era. Because, it, you know, in my era, even though there was less uh, opportunities for our jobs, um, you know, even though WCW was still around for a minute, um, you know, there's just so much more talent today. Um, you know, you didn't have this kind of crazy talent. 
um, 20 years ago. So, uh, you know, it's going to be rough. So just, you know, work hard and do all the things you have to do, man. You got to focus. Go ahead, guys. Brian, go ahead. Oh, I'm up. Okay. Uh-oh. Yeah, sure. <laughs> DJ, I, I always thought that the uh, the Aldo uh, Montoya Portuguese Man of War character was really cool. Uh, can you tell us about how that character came to be? Um, sure. Uh, I was uh, simply, um, you know, um, working at the studio, um, uh, just helping another wrestler, um, you know, working out with him. There was no school, at a bad, no, no performance center back in those days. So I was helping train Brian Lee. To, uh, to to come in, it was 1994, to do the fake Undertaker gimmick. So it was myself, Brian Lee, and uh, Undertaker. Uh, Monday through Friday, I was up at the office with them, just, you know, being like a, a you know, an extra body so they could bump around. Um, long story short, Friday comes along, they were doing a dress rehearsal where Vince McMahon, Pat Patterson came down to see the fake Undertaker, what he looked like, and you know, because I was going to be wrestling him on Monday Night Raw Live. Uh, so they just wanted to kind of get a first-time glimpse of what the audience was going to see. So we go through that. Everything is good, you know. Everything worked out. And uh, anyways, Pat Patterson was asking me questions about who had trained me, uh, what nationality I was, and did I speak it. When I told him I spoke, I am Portuguese and I spoke Portuguese, he told uh, Vince right out loud, uh, Vince popped. You know, which I didn't expect him to. I was like, what the hell, you know? What's the big deal? I'm Portuguese. Um, but the long story short, which I come to find out weeks later, that they were looking for a Portuguese character all along to fit this Aldo Montoya role. The role was was built before I was, you know, they didn't do it with me in mind. They wanted a Portuguese guy, and I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Hmm. So I'm going to take you to the 90s. You're in the WWF, WWE. I mean, you you were in there with the wrestlers that we grew up watching, um, and you were in a 96 Royal Rumble. You got eliminated by Tatanka. I used to love Tatanka. <laughs> what was it like being in a Royal Rumble? And, like, do you guys have, like, a set amount of time? Like, when you go in there, you know, like, you're going to be in for X amount of minutes, or is it kind of like play yeah, by yeah, yeah. Fave? You, you, you know, I remember uh, I did the 95 one, and the 95 one was the one uh, – was the one that Sean won and he was in there for the whole time. And I actually got to do some spots with Sean and Sean threw me out in that one. I remember that one much more uh, than the one with uh, in 96 with the Tonga. That one I didn't spend as much time in. Um, but yeah, man, it's super cool, dude, just to, to be in that situation and, and to be working with all these legends. I mean, it's pretty cool. It's surreal at some point, you know, you don't, and it's like it's almost like too much for for a young man. Like I was twenty one, twenty two years old. Here I am working with all these greats. It's like it's hard to be assertive. You know what I mean? Unless you're very well coached up and you have a lot of you know a lot of belief in yourself. Um, it, it's kind of rough because these are the people you you look up to and idolize. It's hard to kind of just be out there and and start taking stuff. You know what I mean? As far as like. And, you know, just giving them moves and kind of calling it out there for yourself, you know. So um, it's it, it was cool, though, for sure. Uh, PJ, you were in a uh, alliance with uh, Prince Albert, X Pac. Uh, tell us a little bit, of, like, how often did you guys get together to train? <clears throat> did you guys talk on the phone? Like, how like how did the the, the alliance work? is and make it on tv to make it pop um we we got along we we you know at times we even traveled together but uh you know we didn't do anything in the ring uh together for the most part unless uh maybe you know uh that the day we get to tv if we had a move or something in mind but uh you know it's funny we're very much and this goes for all the wrestlers too anybody that's doing angles with one another for the most part, there are exceptions, but for the most part, we just uh, all go our own ways and just, uh, you know, when you're, when you go to TV, that's, that's when you go to work and uh, you usually don't, you know, you're not really buddy buddies, even though I was closer to Sean Waltman than I was to many other guys in the business, but still, it's very much like, uh, you know, it's like going in into work, you got your work buddies, but then when you leave, you don't really talk to them. Uh, it's kind of like that, you know? 
Hey, one more each, guys. Brian, Kevin, Rollo, me. Okay. Um, well, PJ, I, you know, when you were in ECW, uh, you began using that, you know, the That's Incredible Corkscrew uh, pile driver as your finisher. So can you tell us how and, and why you chose that move? Um, it was an accident, believe it or not. Um, I had a match with Jerry Lynn, uh, and it was both, I think it was for both of us, it was our first match at the ECW arena. And, um, I had used it and Jerry had this cool little reversal spot. So, you know, I have him in it. He has me in it kind of just go back and forth. Um, which then I ended up hitting him with the move. Um, and then I went on to pin him with, uh, like, a. I think it was like a spinning DDT or something because I didn't have a finishing move and Paul wanted me to go over. Um, Paul was the one that saw the the tombstone and he's like, let's make that your finishing move from now on. Uh, you know, he liked the way it looked. So it was just kind of happens, you know, just happened to be something that he liked. And uh, I said, sure, you know, you know what you're doing. So absolutely. That's how it really came to fruition. If there was one match to, de to define your career or like that was like a highlight of your career, wh which match would, would you say that one is? That's a good question. Uh, there's a bunch, but I would say one that always um, keeps getting brought back and, and told, you know, that people like was, uh, God, let me see if I get this right. Heat Wave 98, uh, myself and Jerry Lynn at the uh, sold out Hera Arena in Dayton, Ohio. For some reason, it was it's considered probably the best ECW pay per view or that we've ever put on top to bottom. Um, so uh, that match was is I did the uh, that's incredible off the top rope to Jerry Lynn. Uh, just a just a ton of insanity and the whole card through and through was just amazing, amazing atmosphere, amazing show. So uh, I would say that one for sure. We just debated the top four. Uh... ECW wrestlers of all, of all time. Who would you put on your Mount Rushmore for top four ECW wrestlers of all time? Um, I would certainly put Tommy Dreamer, Sabu, Van Dam, Taz, and Shane Douglas. Nice. For sure. Yeah. Everyone but Kevin's guy. All right. I like that. <laughs> so we'll get you out of here with this uh you were in you know i think it's a match that's very remembered from you the final match of ecw so i mean what did it mean to you just that paul came to you and said you know you're gonna you're gonna be the last man to, to wrestle for this company um believe it or not we were never told oh wow Okay. And going into that, I was never told uh, about that match, that it was going to be it. We were still being fed uh, a bunch of stuff that something could happen, that, you know, Paul's still out there looking for, you know, stuff to, you know, pull out of his ass. So we were all still, we kind of knew deep down inside that it was going to be it, but uh, Paul never really told us. I mean, hell, Paul... Paul claimed that, uh, you know, when I signed my contract in WWE, he claimed that he was still trying to get, you know, uh, something for ECW. <laughs> you know, and that, that's like, you know, and he's, he was just full of shit back then and those days. I don't know why, but uh, I guess he owed a lot of people a lot of money. But uh, anyways, I digress. But, yeah, it was, uh, to me, I didn't really know for sure. So it was not a big deal. Well, thank you so much. Justin oh, Incredible, Aldo Montoya, Peter Polacco, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, guys. Thank you so much for having me, man. I really, really appreciate your time. It's been fun. Excellent. I'll remind everybody, hit that like, subscribe, notification button. We'll see everybody next time. Everyone have a great night.